Good evening and welcome to tonight's program. I'm going to talk tonight about what should be a familiar topic, uh, abandoned rail lines. Maybe that sounds obscure, but I'm sure everyone is familiar with the many regional trails uh, that crisscross the county. Actually, most of them go east-west. This might be the Lake Minnetonka Rail, the North Cedar Trail, the Dakota Rail Trail, the Loose Line. Um, all of them are very popular recreational trails for bicycling, walking, running, you name it. And I think most of us are aware that these used to be railroad lines. What an abandoned railroad, though, is also a legal entity as well as a physical reality. Laws governing railroad abandonment uh, go back a long ways for the purpose of our presentation. Uh, the two that are relevant were a pair of federal laws, one in 1871 and another one in 1922. Uh, after that, there's also state laws uh, governing what happens to uh, railroads uh, when their lines are abandoned. Uh, the ones that are governing them now that have turned uh, many railroad, uh, former railroad right of ways into uh, recreational trails are a fairly recent phenomenon. This started back uh, first in the 1960s. Most of the laws in place date from the 1980s. Um, these refer to the creation of rail banks. Uh, and allow for other measures uh, to ease the transition of these uh, abandoned right-of-ways into recreational trails. The right-of-ways themselves uh, were established uh, through a series of fees or grants or simple easements uh, that railroads uh, acquired uh, when crossing over land, since obviously when a railroad went through, it passed over uh, many private lands, um, and typically through the payment of a fee or an establishment of an easement, uh, they were granted the right of passage over private lands. Um, when the line was abandoned, uh, and lines were abandoned for many reasons, uh, normally what would happen is it would go back to uh, the private landholder, um, although uh, in many instances federal laws allowed for um, other uh, developments to take place. The 1922 law specifically had a one-year window where the uh, the land could be converted into roadways. Obviously, by the 1920s, there was a strong interest uh, in developing new roadways and obviously a recognition that the roadway was starting to supersede the railroad as a rapid means of uh, travel. When the lines were abandoned, also, there was not an obligation to the railroad to rip up the tracks and the ties, uh, and oftentimes they may uh, have persisted for even decades uh, after the line was abandoned. Uh, the picture on the right here on your screen, for example, shows an abandoned line in the Invergrove Heights area. You can see the trees growing up between the ties and the rails. It's obviously been there many years. Uh, personally, I can speak to this also. The uh, Lake Minnetonka line, which ran uh, by a house I used to live in, uh, was abandoned uh, probably 30 years ago, but as recently as five or eight years ago, I remember seeing some rails um, along the side of the trail uh, up by uh, the Minnetonka Mills area. Um, so sometimes the uh, the evidence of the railroad is actually uh, actually persists long after the abandonment of, abandonment of the line. Uh, but other physical indications of uh, the lines um, can persist, as we will see tonight, uh, much, much longer. Um, now, the lines um, that I'm going to talk about were not converted into recreational trails, uh, except for maybe a few short areas that people maybe not even are aware of were right-of-ways, and those are the ones that we're going to look at tonight. Um, these hidden abandoned railroads are actually all over the state. Uh, here's a map of uh, current and existing railroad lines. The red ones are existing, the yellow ones are abandoned. As you can see, there's a lot more yellow ones than red ones. So you may encounter a, um, a, an abandoned railroad line and not even realize uh, that that's what it is. Um, and sometimes, uh, Parts of the abandoned railroads are repurposed or torn up or developed over and other parts persist. And we will see much evidence of that in, our, in uh, my talk with you tonight. Going back to the beginning, uh, obviously these began as real railroads. Um, 
And the two that we're looking at here uh, are the Great Northern Line on the south end that went out to Excelsior and Tonka Bay, and the Chicago, Milwaukee, or St. Paul and Milwaukee line, or the Milwaukee Road line that went out to Deep Haven. And these were a pair of spurs uh, that came out of Hopkins. Uh, this old map from the 1880s, Hopkins was still known as West Minneapolis. You can see that on the far right end of the screen. Uh, the one that ran through it uh, that was already there was the old Minneapolis and St. Louis line. And this is this line lasted much longer into the 20th century. Um, and by the time it was in, it was abandoned, they were converting the old lines, the old right of ways into recreational trails. And this is the um, Lake Minnetonka Trail that runs out of Hopkins uh, and goes down through Excelsior uh, and eventually on its way into Carver County. Um, but the uh, the looping line up at the top uh, that you can see here, um, this is uh, called the Deep Haven Spur, the Deep Haven part of um, the track coming out of Deep Haven Junction. And then this lower one, the Great Northern Line, is the one that went out uh, ultimately to Tonka Bay. So those are the two we're going to look at. Um, these two were built mainly. Uh, if not principally, to take advantage of the Lake Minnetonka tourism boom uh, of the 1870s and 80s. The 1880s in particular were a boom time for the city of Minneapolis. The population tripled during this time. The, econ the economy was booming. There was a lot of uh, immigrant uh, population growth in the city. Um, and Lake Minnetonka was a popular tourism destination. Um, not only for the locals, but even for people from uh, out of town. Um, so the Hotel St. Louis obviously was appearing, it was appealing to people coming up uh, all the way from St. Louis to enjoy the cooler weather by the lake. Um, or uh, people even coming in from Kansas City or Chicago, uh, as well as the locals. So on uh, the north end of the loop, the Deep Haven one, uh, the the terminus of that was uh, the site of the Hotel St. Louis, uh, which is now uh, uh, the area around Deep Haven Beach. Uh, and on the South Loop, uh, the Great Northern Line, um, it would have been um, the Hotel Otero in uh, Excelsior uh, and the Tonka Bay Hotel um, on Tonka Bay. These were grand uh, uh, multi-room hotels uh, facing the lake. Uh, of course, they were all made out of wood. Fire was definitely a problem. Um, that and other factors uh, made this boom fairly short-lived. Uh, by the 1890s, uh, things had started to run out of gas. Uh, just to backtrack a little bit to uh, the construction of these lines, when they put them out, uh, these spurs, it was very much work that was done by hand. Uh, they were economic adventure, economic ventures. They were not government funded. Uh, the railroads themselves were privately owned, uh, and the work was done principally by uh, cheap immigrant labor. Um, if they had to put in uh, new berms, the uh, the earth was moved in by ox cart or horse drawn cart. Uh, they didn't have big dump trucks. They didn't have dynamite that they used to land. Uh, the work must have been tremendously hard and the working conditions must have been brutal. As I said, by the 1890s, the uh, the boom was over with. Uh, it was um, there were already other options as railroads expanded for people to go on vacation. The thing that really finished it off, there was a severe economic depression through the 1890s, uh, resulting from the so-called Panic of 1893. And this persisted through much of the um, the decade. The lines were abandoned by their owners. Uh, and in fact, in this 1903 map, you can still see the Deep Haven Loop uh, coming around the top here. But on the lower end here, you can't even see the old Great Northern Line. It was still there, no doubt about it. In fact, you can still see a little spur going out here to the Tonka Bay, uh, but it was really no longer in use. Um, however, um, the rising star in those days was the streetcar system. Uh, by uh, the early aughts, uh, the streetcar system, uh, Twin Cities Rapid Transit, uh, was um, uh, at high tide. They were uh, um, enjoying their peak level of usage. Um, 
this was really before the automobile. Uh, the population in Minneapolis was over 300,000 uh, and spreading across uh, uh, the metro uh, because, of course, this was both Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, the illustration um, on the screen here is from a painting uh, that uh, hangs at the downtown Minneapolis Central Library uh, illustrating the streetcar system. Uh, this was done by someone in connection with the city, uh, John Jager, um, who uh, painted this first, I believe, in 1905 and then added to it a few years later as some of the lines expanded. When the streetcar system bought up these two lines, um, they did extensive renovation on them. They used to be single lines, the southern route um, going down uh, through Glen Lake here on its way out to Excelsior uh, became a double track line, so they had to widen the berm. Um, and of course, they had to in install electrical lines and lighting along the way, so it was a major investment on their part. You'll notice also that they have the little dotted lines running across the lake here. Uh, they tapped into it for the same reason uh, that the railroads had. They were trying to take advantage of the lake uh, tourism traffic. Although by this time, the population locally had grown that they felt that there was enough interest uh, just on the regular commuter traffic uh, routes, the regularly scheduled runs of the streetcar uh, would support or would be supported by uh, people going out uh, for recreational purposes. Uh, and they had a fleet of boats uh, that would also take people across the lake uh, to uh, points of um, um, amusement or recreation uh, around uh, Lake Minnetonka, most notably uh, Big Island. Um, one thing to note, um, many of you are aware of the little trolley car that runs out in Excelsior uh, along the line uh, in the southeast uh, corner of town. Uh, this is obviously a tip of the hat to the old streetcar that used to run through town. However, it actually runs on the old Minneapolis St. St. Louis line. As I mentioned earlier, that line lasted much longer uh, past uh, into the 1970s. Uh, I can remember hearing uh, trains on that track when I was a child, in fact. Um, but that is not where the streetcar ran. The street streetcar actually ran right down Water Street, right down a, uh, the main part of Excelsior uh, before um, hanging to right and heading on out to Tonka Bay. Um, here's a photograph as well as a cartoon illustrating the lake service uh, that uh, the Twin Cities Rapid Transit Company employed uh, that I mentioned earlier, getting people out to uh, the islands or other destinations uh, around the lake. The big one, as I mentioned, was Big Island. Uh, there was a whole amusement park built out there. It did not last very long, but um, it was a major destination uh, with rides and pavilions um, and uh, other recreational structures, uh, either for people just to enjoy the weather or amuse themselves. Um, it did not last very long, uh, closed after 1911. Uh, however, they did try again uh, at the Excelsior Amusement Park in 1920. This uh, amusement park was much more successful. Um, I can remember visiting that when I was a small child um, and it long outlasted the streetcar runs out there. But again, it was built for the same purpose as the Big Island Park. It was a draw to get people out um, um, to the lake and on the streetcars. But by the 1920s, um, the line was already, it was it was never a good financial investment. Um, it was dependent largely on these points of amusement. The hotel traffic was gone. There weren't any hotels out there. So really you were just going out there to either hang around Excelsior or go to one of the amusement parks or after the uh, big island closed, it wasn't even that. Um, as this postcard here uh, illustrates, once you got out of Hopkins, you were pretty much in farm country. Even as late as World War II, 90% of the population of Hennepin County was within the city limits of Minneapolis. You had these streetcars going out there, but there really wasn't the commuter traffic uh, even on the daily basis to even begin to support these, uh, these lines economically. Uh, so 
quite literally, there was nowhere for them to go uh, with these lines. And by the 1920s, uh, in what was also the beginning of the general decline of the streetcar service, as more and more people rode, uh, drove automobiles, uh, the line went into eclipse. Uh, and as in the case of the railroads in the 1890s, uh, it was economic depression that uh, ultimately finished off the two lines. Um, here we have an illustration of a double-decker car going through Excelsior. This is uh, shortly before the closure of the line. Um, the Deephaven line uh, ended in 19, after 1931, uh, and the Excelsior one ended in 1932. However, unlike the, um, as was the case with the railroad closures in uh, 1890, there was no turning back at this point. Uh, I mentioned the 1922 law, but conversion of abandoned lines into um, into roadways. And this certainly happened for a good stretch of the Excelsior line, which was turned into what is now State Highway 7. Um, here we have a photograph of the development uh, in the area around Vine Hill Road, looking out towards Excelsior. Um, this began in 1934, shortly after the closure of the line uh, completed in 1935. That highway runs from St. Louis Park all the way out to the South Dakota border. Um, this particular section of uh, the line starts about where the Minnetonka High School is here uh, and then uh, heads on into Excelsior. You can actually see the line, the old right of way in this 1937 aerial that ends abruptly where the highway picks up. So that was the end of the physical line. Uh, there was no going back, but the persistence of the right of way lasts decades longer. Uh, I'm going to go through a series of images here that will illustrate how it continued to be very visible. So this is a 1937 aerial, and on it you can see uh, a few principal roadways here. We have Highway 7 again running through here. We've got Baker Road running north-south. This is Lake Street Extension here, and this looks like another roadway here. Well, it's not. This is the old right-of-way uh, for the Deep Haven Line. Uh, in fact, off of Baker, you have a little turnabout here, which was for the, uh, the little uh, train stop or depot there. This is all long gone here. Um, but as we will see, many segments of this particular line still persists even to this day. Um, like, likewise, on the southern route, um, well, excuse me, we're still on the Deep Haven line, continuing uh, uh, farther north, uh, this is where it loops around and comes past, this is Williston Road here. Uh, this is actually the Minneapolis-St. Louis line, which uh, was still running as a railroad in the 1930s, and Minnetonka Boulevard runs through here. But you can still see the line very clearly uh, running up through here over um, State Highway 101 and down into uh, Woodland and North Home. On the Excelsior line, uh, this is also particularly curious. The most prominent feature of this segment of Minnetonka is actually this abandoned line. Again, it looks like a regular roadway from viewed from above. Um, it is more prominent than Excelsior Boulevard, which is only dimly available here, dimly visible here. Um, and this pattern consists uh, persisted for quite a while. You remember earlier I showed you that illustration or that uh, aerial photograph rather of the old right of way in the 1937 aerial ending abruptly at Highway 7. Well, the point where it ends is where in uh, the early 1950s, the Minnetonka High School was built. Um, now, in those days, uh, if you were looking down on uh, the city of Minnetonka or township, uh, it wasn't a Minnesota city until 1955, uh, back in those days, the thing that would have struck you most versus the way it is now is how few trees there are. Um, uh, how few trees there were, rather. Um, the area was mostly farms, no surprise, uh, and most of the trees had been cleared. So when the high school was built, uh, this is a picture from the 57 yearbook, uh, it was pretty much plopped down in the middle of farm area here. Um, and you can see that uh, in this view looking east. 
the one exception is this wedge of trees that is coming through here and you can see a gap in the middle of it. This is the old right of way and that is exactly where it ends. Now we will see later um, that this segment is still very much visible even today. Even in 1971, this is 40 years after the closure of the Deep Haven line, you can very clearly see the seam, if you will, of the old right of way running up here until it crosses Lake Min or crosses uh, Minnetonka Boulevard. This forms the western border, if you will, of the Minnetonka Industrial Park. Uh, and this is this is a this is a uh, physical manifestation of the old line that is again very much in evidence. Um, here it is crossing Williston, going up along the side of the, uh, the industrial park. This is again the uh, Minnetonka or, or uh, uh, Minneapolis-St. Louis uh, rail line, now a recreational trail, and it continues on up here until it meets uh, Minnetonka Boulevard. Uh, now this is a this is a bit of a leap here, but uh, evidence of the line is visible even today looking at Google Earth. Uh, again, you can see it running along the industrial park here. Uh, there's another segment of here. This straight line here is actually the uh, uh, right of way for uh, for the line. You can see a bit of the seam running down here through woodland. And then finally, this gap running between the two streets here is uh, another segment of the right of way. So those are from photographs. Uh, as soon as we run to property documents or cross over to property documents, it becomes even more obvious uh, where the line was. So here we have the same segment uh, of the Deep Haven uh, half of the, uh, uh, of the line. Running from Woodhaven Road here in Williston, you can see the line running along the south or the uh, southwest side of uh, Minnetonka Industrial Park and then picks up again here along Minnetonka Boulevard, running along Prospect Place here. You can still see that straight line going around here. And then you got these little narrow tri or rectangles that are property segments in and of themselves, but were sections taken out of the old right-of-way. And you can see this runs all the way down uh, into Woodland and North Home. Keep in mind, a lot of segments here, there's nothing there to indicate that there was the line there. In some instances, yes, there is the remnant of the berm, but in most instances, it's simply running over private property. But because of the way the land was redistributed after abandonment, it continues to show up in these property records. Uh, the same thing on the Excelsior line. It's running here along Stewart Lane here, and then you can see this long seam running down through here. Again, that is where um, the right of way was. In some instances, like in the Deep Haven lines, they may have taken sections out of it, um, or in this instance, it simply denotes the property line division between separate properties. Uh, and after, and sometimes it goes away altogether, like the development around Randall Lane here, and then picks up again and runs along here. So there isn't a consistency to it, but it is an obvious pattern when you're looking at the maps. Uh, likewise, down here, uh, you can see the line running as a long, thin strip out of Excelsior. In this case, it continues on here with the Minneapolis-St. Louis line, but the streetcar or railroad line actually took this loop here along here through along Manitou Park. I've been down there and there's absolutely no evidence of the line departing uh, this strip, which is now a recreational trail and going along Manitou Park. But once you hit Lila Lane here, it becomes very obvious that that was the old right of way. And then it continues again, that long seam here, continuing out to Tonka Bay. So those are the old property line maps. When you get into the property records, it's even more obvious. Uh, so here we have a segment of um, we have a segment of property uh, along the Excelsior line here, and it's specifically referenced uh, in the meets and bounds descriptions here. I'll en enlarge that for you here. So you can see here abandoned right-of-way railroad, uh, or abandoned, abandoned railroad right-of-way. 
Uh, why these records persist, I'm not sure. Uh, my guess is they simply haven't been edited out over the years. There's thousands of property records, uh, but I don't. I've not been able to come up with a reason as far as why these persist. Because remember, this is almost nine. It's almost 90 years since these lines have been handed, and there's there's obviously no going back on them. In the half section maps, um, it becomes even more obvious. Uh, that these, uh, uh, the existence of these former lines. So this is the deep haven part uh, of our exploration here. And you have um, Minnetonka Boulevard here down at the bottom. You have Highway 101, and you have what looks to be some kind of a big road running up uh, along here, except that it's not a road. This is the old right of way. Um, and it's running through there like a super highway uh, compared to the other roads. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize there's really nothing there when you're looking at it. Um, this is past the industrial park area, running through a residential area here, except for a small trail running off fair trial here. There's, um, there's virtually no physical evidence up there of it. But in these legal records, it's abundantly clear that the right of way was there. Um, You'll get other references. So, for example, I had talked about this, uh, the right of way running into where Minnetonka High School is, and then Highway and before it picks up Highway 7. And yet they're still in this area referencing that old uh, railroad right of way. Um, and again, I have no idea why this information persists on these old property records, uh, since there is nothing more for them to work with on uh, as far as uh, the old the old right of way berms or much less tracks. Uh, sometimes they will even reference uh, the previous owners uh, of the railroads. So this in this case, uh, this is a section through North Home. Uh, they skip over the old Twin Cities uh, Rapid Transit Company and go back to the original Chicago Milwaukee uh, St. Paul Railroad. Uh, so this is hearkening back to uh, a uh, previous owner that hasn't owned the land in 130 years. Um, so the persistence of this information in property records I find fascinating. So now we've looked at paper records. Now we're going to get down more on the ground level. Uh, and if you were to walk or drive or bike or whatever this line, uh, this is, this is going to give you an idea of what it is that you're going to see. So we're going to go back to the beginning here. Um, about a half a mile west of um, Hopkins on Excelsior Boulevard uh, is where the lines diverge. Again, they, they emanated in, uh, in, in Hopkins, uh, but they didn't actually separate until you reach the point of uh, what is called Junction Park. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. It's called that, obviously, because the lines met or diverged. Uh, and then it continued down the roadway of what is now Excelsior Boulevard. Excelsior Boulevard back in the day uh, was actually uh, what is now known as Pioneer Road. Uh, so this somewhat windy, loopy road here was the original Excelsior Boulevard, whereas this nice smooth curve uh, was the railroad right of way. Uh, back to another aerial here, we're down at the Glen Lake uh, in an intersection. Uh, and I have this out here because you still can see uh, the turn onto, oops, me, the turn onto um, Eden Prairie Road uh, was actually a bridge uh, until uh, I believe the 1950s. Um, the turn onto Eden Prairie Road, you went on a bridge that went over the old right of way. Now, for those of you that are familiar with the Glen Lake uh, intersection there, it's it's a rise. Uh, if you're coming up from the south on Eden Prairie Road, you have to go up a rise to the intersection. Likewise, coming from the east or coming from the west, everything rises up to meet at that intersection. Uh, well, previously, uh, the the rise was to meet a bridge, which, went over, uh, which was immediately south uh, of the intersection. And you can see it running through here uh, on this, um, on this aerial. Um, currently, there is nothing visible uh, regarding this. The bridge was torn down, uh, the um, right of way was filled in, uh, all traces of it uh, are gone in the intersection. Uh, but um, 
the uh, retail area uh, on the southwest corner here is still called Glen Lake Station, and indeed the park uh, nearby, uh, Minnetonka Parks, uh, uh, has also named it the Glen Lake Station, and in fact, the, uh, the sign there, you will notice it has two rails on it. Uh, I dare say many people look at that in wonderment, uh, totally unaware that uh, a railroad line ever went through there, and indeed it is a very long time ago. Just past the end of that uh, strip mall on the southwest corner of Glen Lake, though, you can see the start of the visible right-of-way. If you walk out behind Glen Lake Animal Hospital, uh, there is a trail that goes out into the woods, and as you walk out on it, uh, particularly, uh, say, uh, in the fall, uh, when the leaves are down, uh, the evidence of the right-of-way is very clear. Um, it's about 20 feet wide, about 10 feet high on either side, uh, and runs straight uh, through the woods for uh, about 100 yards before it runs into somebody's house, um, somebody's private property. Uh, but for that stretch, uh, and in different areas along the way, you will see uh, former evidence uh, of these uh, right-of-ways. Now, further along down Excelsior Boulevard, the, uh, the, the right-of-way um, or remnants of it uh, here from time to time. For the most part, you're running through uh, private property and houses, uh, and uh, any evidence of the right-of-way uh, is gone until you get to the fire station. Uh, the fire station just short of Purgatory Park uh, in the, on the west side, uh, the right-of-way becomes much more visible. Uh, here's a photograph of it, and you can see uh, the flat top, the curved sides, uh, totally overgrown by trees, of course, this is 90 years later, uh, but it's definitely very much in evidence. Uh, and finally, when it gets to the entryway uh, to Purgatory Park, if you ever drive in there uh, about 100 feet in on your left, you'll notice a big concrete wall. Uh, this is the uh, abutment for the rail bridge that went over Purgatory Creek. Um, when the line closed in 32, uh, not many years after that in 1940, uh, a house was built above there and they elected to keep the uh, um, the abutment there, which served as a retaining wall uh, to uh, support the house. Um, on the other side, however, it was torn down. Uh, when exactly the bridge was torn down, I don't know, but you can see in this old postcard uh, a um, representation of what it looked like. This is a uh, colorized photograph. Uh, I can say uh, that, uh, I can tell you though, that uh, this is much what it looks like uh, at Purgatory Park with the uh, creek running through there, uh, except obviously the bridge is long gone. And on the west side uh, of the uh, um, uh, the ravine, uh, the, the old right-of-way picks up again, there is no abutment there, uh, but again, it runs for maybe another 100, 200 feet until it runs into private property again. And from here, um, it will run either over, through, or between properties until you get to the high school. And you remember I showed you that picture of that wedge of, of woods uh, running up to the edge of the high school with the seam uh, in between of the old right-of-way. Uh, this is that same wedge. Uh, and you can see when they built the high school, they kind of had to wind around here a little. It almost looks like they had to shape the school itself to accommodate this wedge of land. Uh, and as you drive up the driveway behind the school, it's still there. Uh, it's a bit of a rise here. Uh, you can see the slope of the old berm on both sides. Uh, on this side of the fence is school property and the other side is private property. But that is exactly where the right of way ran. So uh, in as much as this physical entity exists, you can still see evidence of um, the right of way right next to the high school there. But from there, everything pretty much disappears. Um, you really don't see any evidence around Excelsior. Obviously, the line was wiped out by Highway 7. Uh, even west of town, I mentioned that uh, when you're around Manitou Park, you really can't see any evidence of where the line, the Tonka Bay line, went north until you get to Lila Lane. I have been told, though, uh, as you get further up into Tonka Bay, and it is going through private property, you can still see evidence of the berms or the old right-of-way uh, uh, on private property. I mean, I haven't 
tried to go trespassing or ask people to or ask it to intrude on people going over their lands. But I have talked to other people who have done that uh, and they report that you can still see the right of way running through Tonka Bay on its way to Lake Minnetonka. So back to the beginning again at Junction Park. Uh, this was also known uh, back in the day as Deep Haven Junction, uh, one line going to Deep Haven, the other going to Sir Tonka Bay. Uh, and as with Glen Lake Station, this one, uh, the city of Minnetonka uh, named the park for that fact. So it's called Junction Park. If you go to the city's website, however, it never gets around to explaining why the parks are named that, uh, much less any references to uh, the old um, railway streetcar lines. But um, just above Junction Park, uh, when you turn off of um, when you turn off of um, Excelsior Boulevard here and hang a left onto Junction Road, it starts immediately out on berm of the old right of way, uh, and you can see the rail guard along there because it's high above the surrounding land. Uh, on on this side of the picture is it falls away into Junction Park, and on this side it falls away sharply into some wetland. Uh, and again, the only reason the roadway uh, is up that high is because it was the rail line. Um, now, one thing I did want to mention here that I discovered when I was looking uh, in this area is this was on the slope uh, on the side below the rail guard in the previous picture. Um, and it was fairly treacherous footing down there, so I didn't go down into investigate it too closely, but I saw this line in the ground and for all the world, it looked like an old tie. Uh, now, it's possible it's a piece of a retaining wall that somebody threw over there. On the other end, it's also possible that a creosote-soaked tie may have lasted this long. I don't know, but uh, physical evidence like this is extremely rare along the lines beyond the persistence of the berms themselves. From Junction uh, Park, it swings north, uh, crosses over what is now Highway 7, and then swings west again. Uh, onto what is now Oak Drive. Uh, and once it crosses Baker Road, remember earlier I mentioned uh, the Baker Road crossing was a former depot site along the road or along the, um, the uh, streetcar line. Uh, and then it goes down Smith Drive. Um, Smith Drive is actually a privately owned street. Uh, the school district owns the land there. Uh, but again, if you look down the side of this driveway here, you will, it's a very steep slope berm. Um, and you will also notice when we're looking at the berms on the Deep Haven line that they are conspicuously narrower uh, than the uh, ones on the Excelsior Punk Bay line. And again, because uh, when the streetcar system took over the system, they redeveloped and re improved the two lines. Excelsior, though, was a double line, while uh, the Deep Haven line was a single track line. This continues west, uh, crossing over what would be, or what is now. Uh, uh, 494, if you were uh, follow it uh, to the edge of 494, uh, the berm is still an evidence of the old right of way uh, for disappearing uh, in the, uh, the canyon, if you will, of the freeway. Uh, from there, there is slender evidence uh, of the previous line. Mainly, uh, you can see it running along Spring Lake Road, disappears through private property. Uh, but once it crosses Williston, uh, this is the Minnetonka Industrial Park I've been referring to earlier, and this whole um, southwestern edge is the old right of way. If you drive through the park and uh, go along the parking lots back here, uh, it rises up about five feet and is maybe 10 feet across and then drops away into the parkland here in the southwest part. Uh, but as you can walk on this entire length, it's an informal trail. Um, parts of it have fallen trees, as you can see in this picture here, uh, and at least one part of it is completely washed away. Uh, so again, it's not a real trail, but many people use it as one, uh, again, because it is this old right of way and it has this flat top here. Uh, is uh, a very distinctive feature along the southwest part of the industrial park. Um, it uh, merges in a way with the Lake Minnetonka Trail, the old Minneapolis-St. Louis line, before disappearing into a townhome development. Uh, but once it gets up um, 
past Minnetonka Boulevard uh, and you turn onto Fairchild Avenue, um, just off to the left, almost immediately on your left, uh, is this um, this recreational trail uh, running uh, northwest uh, for about a half a mile. Uh, and this is a city rec recreational trail, but again, this is the old right of way. Uh, this runs uh, for about a half a mile until it peters out uh, as a trail, but the line obviously continued past that, uh, but it is uh, lost as it were in private properties, homes, etc. cetera. Uh, again, I've been told by people who have been able to track the land uh, or track the trail through the different lands of private property that it's still uh, definitely in evidence. Um, and uh, again, this is a this is a current aerial, and this is a close up here. This is going through the Woodland uh, Northome area, and you can really see the gap in the here where the old line went. Uh, and I'm told that the, the, that you can not only see it here, but that people living along uh, the the line here are quite aware, uh, in many instances, of its former existence. And in fact, uh, there is one how. Uh, uh, homeowner um, along uh, Northam um, who is so much aware that the line passed his property that uh, they actually built this toy railway line all around their property uh, and um, they certainly went to town with this. Um, it's a real steel track with wooden ties uh, over a uh, rock base. Um, I have not actually seen a train run on it, uh, but it looks uh, by all evidence that it could support a small train. Um, um, someone with more money than sense perhaps, but uh, at any rate, uh, after the line goes through here, it disappears onto the roadway before it appears again uh, on the start of the North Home Trail. If you're going down Deep Haven Avenue, you will see um, this sign here, North Home Trail to the Beach, um, and that runs um, from, that'll take you down into a ravine and runs all along uh, to the uh, to the lake. Um, so here it's a, it's, a, it's a formal trail that the city maintains, in this case, the city of Deephaven. Uh, and at one point it passes under a, an old steel bridge which uh, dates from the days of the streetcar and railroads uh, and is still in use even though it's well over a century old. Um, this right of way continues onto a greenway just short of Deep Haven Beach um, and that is the approach to Lake Minnetonka. Again, it's the former right of way. When you arrive at the beach, um, it's a large parking lot. Uh, that's the end of any evidence of the line uh, except to note that the Original Hotel St. Louis uh, would have been on the left. Uh, I didn't note earlier uh, the 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 St. Louis Hotel, Hotel St. Louis, was one of the last hotels on Lake Minnetonka. It closed in 1907, shortly after the streetcar line completed. Uh, I'm told, however, that the depot at this station uh, was repurposed uh, as an outbuilding uh, and moved um, to one of the houses in the area here. <clears throat> 